Okay, well, welcome to uh, CISP 363. This is the second class of the mobile uh, device programming class. Uh, some of you are new to this class, you know, but since you have enough programming background already, um, I think you'll be okay. Uh, as far as the certificate is concerned, uh, you probably will need something to substitute for CISP 362, or you can take CISP 362 in the fall of 2014, you know, if that class is offered, so that you can get you know, all the classes that you need for the certificate. So we'll kind of talk about the arrangement for that you know, later on. Um, but at this point, I just want to make sure that everybody has at least taken or is taking CISP 360, the C++ class at this point. Um, and you know, if, you're, if you have not taken CISP 362, which is the class prior to this one, um, I would like you to have some kind of object-oriented programming uh, background, you know, with CISP 400 um, or even CISP 370, which is the Visual Basic Programming class. Okay, is that okay so far? Okay, yeah. all right. Um, all right. So what we'll do is um, we'll go over the syllabus first. Even though um, some people here have taken classes from me already, um, I'm still going to go over the syllabus and then we'll get started uh, with the content of this class. Um, I use Moodle instead of um, D2L, so in order to get access to class material, you have to go to moodle.losrios.edu instead of the usual d2l.losrios.edu. <coughs> and to sign in, you, know, you guys all have a computer in front of you, in order to sign in, you know, just use your W followed by seven digit student ID as username. And then the password would be the same district password that you use for email, uh, for D2L, and for everything else that you do in district, in the district. Are there any questions about signing in to uh, Moodle? No questions? All right. I need to make one adjustment to the screen. You can see how the, uh, the right hand side is missing something. It has to do with the refresh rate of the display um, set to the wrong frequency. So I need to change the refresh. Oh, it won't let me change it. I guess that's it. Hmm. I can change the resolution, but not the uh, refresh rate. The monitor itself, oh, it's also locked in terms of the refresh rate. OK. So I guess I just cannot use that edge here. So I'll, I'll just position my screen like this. So this way I don't use the portion on the screen that I cannot use. Right. How many people are adding to this class right now? You're not on roster yet. So everybody's on roster? Okay. All right. So I'm in Moodle at this point. If you scroll down to my courses, you won't see as many classes as I see here, but you should see CISP 363. So just click that to get into the class, and your screen may not look the same as mine, which is kind of distracting right now. I'm going to hide some of these you know, panels so I can have more area in the main portion here. Um, what I will do the first, the, what I will do first is to go over the syllabus, um, and then we'll go from there. Okay, the first class you know, I would like to kind of talk about how to set up your tools and your computer so that you can do your homework assignment, both here in the classroom during the lab time and also at home or on you know, whatever computer you have access to. Um, the syllabus is right here. You know, there are two versions of the syllabus. They are they have the same content just different format. Uh, one is a PDF and the other one is just you know, plain HTML. And for projector use, I'm gonna use the HTML version. So, um, and here's the course information. This is programming for mobile devices to the second class in the series. Um, this course introduces intermediate level programming for mobile devices such as cell phones, tablets, and so on. Topics include the syntax of Java, and that's why you know, it is helpful to be either taking CISP 3, uh, 360 um, at the same time or have taken CISP 360 already because C and Java share a pretty good portion of syntax. Okay, for the most part, for control structure and stuff like that, they are very, very similar. 
Um, we'll also talk about object-oriented programming, okay, because you know that's really uh, where this particular programming paradigm shines is when you have user interaction objects um, and, a mo and mobile specific techniques and considerations. Um, that's something that we kind of touch on in CISP 362, um, but we'll definitely expand on that you know, in this class because we'll be programming Android devices directly using Java instead of using um, App Inventor. Um, here are the uh, student learning objectives of this class. You know, after the completion of this class, you should be able to um, you know, do all of these things. <clears throat> this is a four unit class, three units for the lectures, and one unit for the lab. Um, so we are, we'll be meeting 108 hours for this class, 54 lecture hours and 54 lab hours. Any questions about this slide? Fairly typical stuff for you know, classes here. Um, my name is Tak, first name is Tak, last name is Oyoung. Uh, you can just call me Tak. Um, my office is number seven in Liberal Arts 133, which is one aisle to that side of this building. Um, office hours are from Monday to Thursday from eight to nine o'clock, which is convenient for this class because it's right before this class. So if you have any questions or for whatever reason you want to see me face to face, you know, you know where and when to find me. Phone number is 484-8250. The email is drtech2014spring at gmail.com. So I'm trying out you know, this method of having you know, one Gmail account per semester. And uh, Google has not complained yet, so I'm going to be using that. <laughs> <coughs> Google has not even complained about all my uh, video recording. You know, I think for, I have been doing recording for the past at least two years with all of my lectures. Each one is 80 minutes long, about 1.6 gigabytes of upload, and they have not complained yet. So it's it's good. I think you know they think you know whatever we do to bring more people to watch YouTube is welcome. You know, storage is free. As long as you don't have like copyright. Right, not, um, yeah, as long as it's your stuff, okay, as long as you own the copyright, it's okay. So as long as you don't, you know, try to copy somebody else's stuff and put it on YouTube, you know, then it's okay. Yeah. yeah I have been a very, very good YouTuber, you know, as far as that is concerned. Um, and, uh, and that's partially why I can upload up to almost four hours in one single clip. Because, you know, they just say that, hey, there's no reason not to let me upload you know, longer uh, video clips, as opposed to people who always upload like you know, uh, movies and whatnot, you know, copyrighted material. So those people will not get the extended length of uh, upload. Yep. I think you can enable it. You just have to give them like your phone number or something to verify. Is that all? Yeah. Okay, but I also know that they need you to be in good standing. You know, yeah. as soon as you're as not in good standing, you you get your uh, upload time down to 15 minutes again. And I have the tool to chop my videos into 15 minute chunks, but I would rather not do that. <clears throat> the online classroom, you know, we basically you know, where you find all the material for this class is over at moodle.losreels.edu. So we talked about that a little bit already. Section three talks about um, <coughs> the meeting time and when we will have the final exam. And obviously this is from last semester because it is in 2013, December. So we'll go ahead and look up the exam time for this class right now. And I think most of you know how to you know, look it up already. So we'll go ahead and do it anyway. Class schedule. Where's the exam, final exam? Go back to the uh, spring 2014 class schedule. There, there we go. Okay, so this class is meeting on Mondays and Wednesdays, and the start time is at 9 o'clock. So that's why we are going to have our final exam on the 19th of May from 8 to 10 o'clock. Okay, so make sure you. Uh, reserve that block of time for the final exam of this class. Any questions about this part? 
going to have to update my uh, syllabus you know, to make sure this is up to date. <coughs> Class policies and rules. Um, a part of this you know, has been modified. Um, and I'll show you, you know, for those of you who have you know, read something like this already, I'll show you which part is extended. Uh, this is a new link, okay? You know, um, and I was kind of surprised that when I showed this to all of my students, not just some, but all of my students, very few didn't even know that this document existed. Um, this is actually a link um, from one of the email messages when you first enrolled to the Los Rios district. Um, it talks about a lot of useful stuff. I'm not going to go into the detail. I'm just going to say that you know, this is a useful document. If you have time, go ahead and read it. In fact, you know, to you should read it you know, in order to acknowledge uh, the uh, syllabus. So we'll go ahead and talk about accept acceptable excuses for this class. In other words, if you cannot make it to the class, uh, what excuses you know, I have to accept in this case. So these three reasons I have to accept as excuses. Uh, one is your own sickness. Uh, the second one is jury duty. And the third one is military duty. Okay, in all three cases, you know, I need to have some kind of uh, documentation okay, or copy of some kind of documentation in order for it to count as an excused absence. <clears throat> uh, the attendance policy of this class you know, follows the attendance policy from the college and also the district. College students are expected to attend all sessions of their courses. Excessive absence may result in the student being dropped from this class by the instructor. A student may be dropped from any class when that student's absences exceed 6% of the total hours of class time. So 6% in this case, um, two classes is slightly below 6%, but the third absent will bump it over 6%. So that means you, know, you are allowed up to two unexcused absences for this class. Okay. Any question about that? Question? Okay. <clears throat> If a student is absent because of illness verified by the health center or personal physician, the absence must be excused and the student allowed to make up work missed. That is also a part of the college catalog. Um, here is um, regulations regarding, uh, regarding a, uh, attendance. The first one is non-attendance at first class. Students who fail to attend the first session of a class may be dropped by the instructor. Um, you don't have to worry about it because this is the first session and you are physically here. Unless I'm talking to someone who's just watching the YouTube later on today or over the weekend. So that person will have to worry about it because you know, that person is not here watching YouTube. Um, excessive absence defined. Um, this is really just a uh, repetition of what we just talked about earlier. And the third one is funny, okay, no-shows. Students who have not attended at least one of the first three sessions of a class will be dropped as a no-show following the third session of the class. So it is kind of redundant, don't you think? Because 3.0, no-shows, covers 1.0. Does everybody see that redundancy? The first class is one of the first three classes, right? So 3.1 clearly says students who have not attended at least one of the first three sessions of a class will be dropped. So it's actually, there's no point in stating 1.0, which is to say that you know, students who fail the first session of a class may be dropped by the instructor. Is that making any sense? So I have no idea why they <laughs> <laughs> write it this way. Um, and I think you know 3.0 has been changed recently too. It it was not like this. I think it was only the first of the only the first two sessions of a class and they bumped it up to three. Yep. Uh, 3.0 does not cover if they miss the first class the first class, uh, day of class. Because they just need to uh, attend at least one of the three days. That's one interpretation. The other interpretation is students who missed at least one of the first three sessions would be dropped. It's not misleading, it's confusing. It is misleading, isn't it? <coughs> it's kind of like, um, <laughs> I know this is irrelevant, 
but it's kind of like um, the law regarding um, what happens when you enter an intersection when it's amber and, it, and the light turn red while you are in the intersection. Did you run a red light or not? No. The law is actually ambiguous. It doesn't say. So it's up to the judge to actually decide that. Um, I had the uh, I had the uh, the fun of having to fight a ticket like that, and I wasn't even rushing, you know, uh, through the intersection. It just turned the light really, really quickly, and it was in San Francisco. I didn't bother to argue with the cop because the cop would just say whatever he or she wants to say. But instead, I challenged, you know, I filed a challenge, you know, remotely to the court in San Francisco because I live here. It's more than 100 miles. You can do it by correspondence. And you know, I you know, fought that particular ticket off you know, because I said, yes, I know that when, while I entered the intersection, it was amber. And by the time I get to the other side, it became red. I just stated the facts. Um, and the judge said, OK, psst, no problem. <laughs> but this one is ambiguous as well. Okay? I think it's ambiguous. Because one way to look at this is to say students who have not attended is basically missed. Okay? At least one of the first three sessions of the class would be dropped. But the other way to interpret it is students who have not attended at least first one of the first three sessions. In other words, you put parentheses you know, around this part first, and then you put a negation around it. That's the other interpretation. So I think I'll go, I'll go to the, con uh, uh, the lawyers working for the district and ask for clarification. Can you put extra parentheses so we know the priority of the operators? Nobody is getting it. <laughs> yeah, they don't computer science. Sorry? They don't take computer science, so they don't know all that. They don't know what parentheses are, right? Yeah. <laughs> or operators. Yeah. So the, does the negation apply to attend, or does the negation apply to this entire clause? That's the question. <laughs> <coughs> they just gonna look at me and go like, eh? Maybe they just intentionally make it ambiguous so they can interpret it in one way or another way, depending on the situation, depending on who they're talking about. All right. Um, how soon to report an excuse? Okay, if you know something happens and you cannot make it to class, how long should you wait before you tell me? Well, personally, I think you know it would be helpful if you let me know as soon as possible because I do take role for my classes, and you know I just you know I do things you know, with my you know, role sheet too. So if you let me know ahead of time or as soon as possible then I might you know, catch your excuse before you know, I do anything to the roster. So I don't have to reinstate <coughs> students and you, don't have, you, don't, you won't lose access to Moodle either. Um, so that would be ideal if possible. Okay? What about the other unexcused you know, reasons? What if you, know, you have children or a child and you know, one of your ch children is sick? What if you, your car you know, broke down in the morning? What if you, you got a flat tire? Um, well, you know, in those cases, I will handle it on a case-by-case -case basis, um, as long as I don't see any particular pattern to, you know, these crises, um, it's going to be okay. I can excuse a few of these things as long as I don't see um, there's a pattern to it. Um, attendance for face-to-face -face classes. This is a face-to-face -face class. Um, I will use a row sheet to take row. Um, it's right here. Can someone remind me to pass it? I would say in about 10 minutes or so, I just let people have a little bit more time to get here. <coughs> uh, classroom and lab behavior. Classrooms and labs are facilities provided only for the scheduled and intended coursework. Um, so technically speaking, that means at this time, this particular classroom is intended for CISP 363. It doesn't mean that if you want to do your calculus homework, I'll you know, come to you and say, now you cannot do your calculus homework. Um, it's just that if it's not disturbing to other people, it's okay. But my recommendation is to focus on you know, CISP 363 at this time. Okay. Any behavior in the classroom or lab, this is kind of like a combination of the two, that interferes with teaching or learning is not tolerated. This includes disruption, <coughs> bullying, excessive chatting, and etc. The following is a list of examples. Chatting, 
Um, if you have a question related to the class, like you didn't quite catch what I said, or you want me to repeat a step that I did a little bit earlier, just let me know, okay? Because if you ask the student you know, next to you, not only are you not focusing on what I'm talking about at that point, but the student that you're asking will also be distracted. So now we have two people getting distracted. So that student next to you will then have to ask the student next to that student for clarification, and it will just kind of propagate until the entire class is chattering and nobody is paying attention to me. Is that making any sense? <laughs> so it's better just to stop me, raise your hand, stop me, and say, well, Tech, you know, I didn't quite catch you know, what you did in the previous step, or I didn't quite understand what you said you know, a little bit earlier, and, you know, and then I'll go ahead and uh, repeat what I said, present it in a different way, or repeat the step and explain how it was done. Okay. Uh, pets. I don't see any pets right now, so I don't think that's going to be an issue. Okay. Cell phones, um, that's a good reminder to myself because I think I have not programmed my cell phone to be on silence mode at this point. A really good app, you know, I talked about this in CISP 362 already. A really good app for this is uh, Tasker um, because with Tasker, you can schedule uh, all kinds of uh, events. You can specify all kinds of events, you know, based on date, time, um, day of week, and so on and so forth, and associate those triggers with actions, like turning off the ringer, uh, turning <coughs> off Wi-Fi, turning off 4G, you know, there's a whole bunch of stuff you can do with Tasker. It, it's a $3 app, you know, but I think it's well worth the $3. <coughs> And as far as eating and drinking is concerned, um, there's a sign right here that says no food, drinks, phones, or kids. So in this particular classroom, because we do have computers you know, in front of everybody, I would refrain from drinking anything, including just plain water. Um, there will be a break between uh, the lecture and also the lab. So if you need to drink something, you know, we can step out and you know, have a little bit of a drink and then come back in. Okay. Any questions about that part? If this is a lecture-only classroom, you know, plain drinking water would be okay. Uh, but since we do have computers in front of us, you know, I know these keyboards are probably resistant to you know water and whatnot. But still, okay. Uh, Non-compliant participants will meet Walter. Okay, nobody's getting that part. <laughs> Walter from the lab. You know, I'm gonna call you know people to remove people who are non-compliant okay. you know, after a few times of uh, warning. Conduct code. Uh, the college catalog actually has a full description of standards of student conduct. So if you do a right, you know, if you click this link here and go to this particular document and look for student conduct, um, right here, standards of student conduct, uh, so it, it's a full specification of what the college and the district expects uh, from students. So I highly recommend that you at least you know, glance through that section of the college catalog. <clears throat> but in my case, you know, in this syllabus, you know, I focus more on academic dishonesty. It is an act of deception in which the student claims credit for work or effort of another person or uses unauthorized material or fabricated information in any academic work. It occurs when students attempt to show possession of a level of competency, knowledge, or skill that they do not possess. Okay? So I'm just going to focus on this part here because it's an intention to show possession of a level of competency, knowledge, or skill that they do not possess. That to me is cheating. Okay? Any act with the intention of that is cheating. Are there any questions about this part? Are there any gray areas that you guys want me to kind of go over? Oh, I got one. What about the result of a Vulcan mind melt? Okay, you guys are not Star Trek fans? Nobody? <laughs> what do you think? For those of you who are smiling right now, because you, seem, you probably have the answer. Case by case basis. Case by case basis. Well, 
in the case of a mind map, okay, the real question is, um, is it repeatable? In other words, if I give the person another test, would that person be without any further contact with the person who actually originate the knowledge, would the other person be able to complete the test with the same performance? If the answer is yes, then it's not cheating. Because that knowledge, the competency, is now in the other person as well. Okay? On the other hand, you know, copying from somebody else is definitely like that because it's not repeatable without the source to copy from. Okay. So any such activity will be reported to administration. You know, we'll start with the division dean. Uh, and accumulation of these attempts, possibly from multiple classes, will lead to expulsion from the college. All students involved in such you know, activities will not receive points for the work submitted. And this includes the person who originates the material as long as that person did so willingly, actively, or otherwise knowingly um, in such an attempt. Activities involving acti academic dishonesty will not count for attendance, <coughs> and the instructor may ask suspects to do additional work or explain submitted work in order to determine the legitimacy of work that is turned in. And in this class, everything is supposed to be done independently, which means without the aid of somebody else, and also originally, which means without copying from or significantly deriving from the works of, of others. Unless, as a part of the homework assignment or the question in the exam, I ask you to start with this file, to start with this code, then obviously it does not, you know, uh, this rule does not apply. Okay? Any questions up to this point? Any questions? All right. And I can retroactively re-examine anything that has been turned in already and even graded for evidence of academic dishonesty and make adjustments to those grades accordingly. Okay. All right, let's go to step five, grading. Uh, letter grade equivalence in this class is a little bit different from most of the other classes. Um, I basically <coughs> go by um, the boundary of quarters, you know, in from zero to one hundred percent. So anything, anyone who's getting twelve point five percent of all the possible points in this class will get an F. Between uh, twelve point five percent and thirty seven point five percent is a D. Between thirty seven point five percent to sixty two point five percent is a B. And between sixty, no, I take it back. Between thirty seven point five percent to sixty two point five percent is a C. 62.5% to 87.5% is a B, and anyone getting at least 87.5% you know, gets an A in this class. Uh, the comp components, well, you know, we'll see how it goes in this semester. But the, um, the way I plan, would like to have it, is to have 20% assigned to homework assignments, 40% to the final exam, 20% to the first exam, and 20% to the second exam. Um, in the previous class, I have been using projects you know, as a big component for the grades. Um, and then for this class, I have not decided yet. So it's, you know, whether it's gonna be a project one or exam one, and then project two or exam two, you know, I, I still have not decided on that yet. <coughs> Uh, grading FAQ score is assigned based on observable academic competence and not effort. Um, you might see multiple choice questions. In that case, uh, the total score of correct answers will equal the total score of incorrect answers. In other words, if someone is just you know trying to randomly select answers, um, on average, that person would get a zero out of the entire thing. So this, it's not intended as a penalty, it's not punitive, it's really just there to make sure that people who know nothing about the subject matter will get a zero. It's the same as not answering anything. Okay. Um, there are no late submission in this class. Submissions after the due date or time will not count and are not permitted. Um, so basically Moodle will close and people cannot turn in anything after a certain time unless there's an excuse like medical reasons and whatnot, and then I can you know, handle those on a case-by-case -case basis. Okay. Going 
to uh, section six, um, helping out a fellow student. Um, it's okay to help out a fellow student. The question is, how are you going to help out somebody else who's asking you for help? Okay. Um, first of all, if the other person is asking, well, can I just copy your homework? Okay, can you show me the code of your homework assignment? Um, I would say the answer is just flat out no. Okay, but the other per if the other person is asking you, can you explain to me, blah blah blah, you know, you know how this concept works, or you know how this technique works, then it's a different story. Okay, you know because you know at that point, I think you know if you want to, uh, you can help out the other student. Helping out another student is beneficial not only to the student that you're helping, but also to yourselves. Um, I'm not sure how many people have the experience of when you try to explain something to another person, you end up gaining you know a better understanding of the material. Okay, I personally understand that because of my current profession, right? So a lot of times, you know, when I teach a particular subject matter let's say you know assembly language programming okay which is a really kind of specialized you know type of programming i have done that for to almost 12 years in industry before teaching here so i thought you know i know most of those concepts i understood you know most of those things but when i teach that class i gain you know another level of understanding you know of those concepts so it's the same way with you know any class if you are really helping out another student by explaining um, concepts and techniques and whatnot, you, know, you typically will get a better understanding of the material. Okay. And this class is not graded by curve, so it's not like you know if you help out another student, the other student would get a higher score than you and bump your grade down, you know, as a result. You know, that just doesn't happen with my classes. So helping out the other student cannot be um, you know cannot be too bad. The only part that you have to be careful about is make sure that it does not uh, constitute uh, academic dishonesty despite your good intention. Um, because some people just keep asking and asking and they, are, they just won't stop you know, asking you for the answer, right? You know, I want to know exactly how you coded this part of the homework assignment. They keep asking and just don't give in, you know, don't let them copy anything from you, you know, so that, you know, that's really the only part that I want to warn you is, um, you know, people who keep asking you for, you know, the, the, the quick way, the easy way out. Okay. Are there any questions about this slide? You know, I just kind of summarized, you know, this portion. <clears throat> uh, the next one is a study habit. Um, you know, attending classes, you know, it's important. Uh, pay attention in class is important too. Um, more and more, you know, I'm noticing that uh, some people do not bring anything to classes to take notes, you know, and uh, with this classroom, I can kind of understand because we do have computers in front of, you know, everybody. So if you want to take notes, you can use the computer to take notes. I mean, particularly, you can use Google Documents, right? Okay, you know, if you use Google Documents to take notes, um, it's not on paper, you don't need a thumb drive, you don't need to send it to anyone, it's just up there in the cloud. So I can certainly understand that. But sometimes I would teach in a um, regular classroom and some portion of my students would not have anything. Not a piece of paper, not a pen, not a pencil, nothing whatsoever. And they're not using a computer or a mobile device to take notes either. It's well, it's just kind of baffling to me, you know, how, you know, they take notes. Um, uh, reading ahead of me would be helpful. You know, I know this is the beginning of the semester, so there's nothing that I can assign for reading at yet at this point. Um, study again after a lecture, because I'm recording all my lectures, so you can actually re-watch the entire lecture uh, right after the lecture, too. Um, start on homework assignments as early as possible. You know, that can only be helpful because starting earlier doesn't mean there's any more work. If anything, starting earlier means that you can, you have time to ask questions, you know, before the homework assignment is due. So that's going to be beneficial. After a homework assignment is due, um, I would disclose my solution. So even if you don't know what your score is for your homework assignment, you can at least compare your solution to mine 
find out what the differences are. In a programming class like this, sometimes there's no unique correct answer. So maybe your answer and my answer are both correct, which is good. But you really need to look at the differences between the two you know, approaches and say, well, you know, it, are these two approaches identical? Do they accomplish the same thing? If they do, it's good. If they don't, then you have to think about, okay, is your solution missing something or is my solution missing something? Because I make mistakes, okay? Um, so you can you know, try to point out mistakes in my solutions as well. All right. And I do use a lot of in-class examples in my classes. Um, those will be all captured by the YouTube uh, screen recording, so you can you know, basically re-watch those, or if you want to, you can replicate those examples on your own as well. All right, so we are now down to section number seven, which is the tentative schedule for this class. Uh, we'll start with the general syntax of Java. Uh, we'll talk about classes and object-oriented programming as a whole. Uh, we'll talk about class as a user-defined type, class <coughs> members, uh, how objects relate to classes, and also inheritance. Um, and we'll do that for two class sessions or so, um, and then we'll move on to subroutines, um, and then talk about debugging a little bit, and then we'll start on you know uh, user interface programming. This is the tentative schedule. Sometimes I deviate from you know what you see here. Um, because what I'll do today instead, instead of talking about the syntax of Java, I'll talk about the tools, okay? How I, there are several options you can set up the tools for this class. So I'll just you know, talk about that first. Are there any questions about the syllabus? Questions? All right. So there are no questions about the syllabus. Oh, quick question. Yep. So is this class focus on um, for Android-based devices, or yep. uh, is there any focus on uh, other devices? This class is only focusing on Android devices. So there are Android programming. Uh, there are uh, inform. There are steps, techniques that will only apply to Android devices. But I would suspect iOS devices will share the general idea of mobile device programming. So learning how to program Android, you know, cannot, I, I think it can be helpful if you really want to program an iOS device. Um, but it does not apply directly to iOS devices. Um, well, that's a, that's a good, that's an interesting question because, you know, it brings up another question. Um, if you can only learn to program one mobile device, which one are you going to learn? In other words, which one is the majority? You know, what is the trend of you know mobile devices? You know, Android versus iOS versus Windows, right? <laughs> what What do you think? Has anyone kept up with uh, the news, the trends, and stuff like that? Go ahead. It's most definitely Android. That yep. Is yep. That's that's kind of interesting because um, a few years ago, you know, I met up with you know some of my classmates, or we communicated over email with my cousin who's in Hong Kong. Um, and at that point, iOS is bigger; it is more popular in Hong Kong, and also especially in China. Um, but now the tide is changing. Um, most people are now, you know either switching to iOS or they are considering you know, switching to iOS. <coughs> They're either uh, switching to Android or considering switching to Android. Um, what are the differences? Uh, the programming is different, but I think it's okay. for iOS. Okay, there are a few differences. Okay, so you're talking about the, uh, the programming side of it. Go ahead. Um, other than, oh, from a developer's point of view, uh, iOS is a lot more restricted based on what can be in the app application store, but also mm -hmm. um, Android has cheaper, it's just cheaper altogether. Um, you know, there's not the whole brand name associated with it as with Apple, et cetera. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, Android is referring to the operating system and uh, the graphical user interface. Yeah. So it's really the software component that you install on a mobile device. Right. Okay. 
um, <coughs> and Google has made it open sourced. In other words, you know, it doesn't cost manufacturer licensing fees in order to use Android on their mobile devices. Um, and there's no limitation. If you want to come up with a mobile device, you know how to design you know, circuit boards um, and mobile devices, and you can shell out enough money you know, for plastic molding and whatnot, you, you too can manufacture your own you know, Android device. But with iOS, it is an Apple-only hardware device, and it's an Apple-only software you know, system. So Apple owns, you know, basically the quote-unquote monopoly on <coughs> iOS devices, whereas you know, where anyone can manufacture and make, you know, um, Android devices. So if you have multiple hardware manufacturers making Android devices, what happens? Fragmentation. Say again. You can have fragmentation, you know, which can be bad, but it can be good as well because you know some people may prefer the Samsung way of doing it. Some people may prefer the HTC way of doing it. So it can be good, it can be bad, but at least it allows the market to play it out to find out you know which one is more popular, what people like, and what people do not like. But one thing it does do for sure is it helps to lower the cost of the hardware because that's competition. Okay, HTC, uh, Vizio, Samsung, um, LG, you know, they all want to compete with each other, right, in terms of you know, selling the hardware. And as a result, the devices are getting less and less expensive. What about Nuke? What, what do you say? Nuke, N-O-O-K? Nuke. Nuke. They are Android devices as well. Even the one that has a um, e-ink uh, screen, that's also an Android device. So you have a, a variety of devices that are actually running Android at this point. It's not just you know your cell phone. It's not just um, um, uh, Google's own you know tablets. You know there's a whole huge variety of Android devices out there. <coughs> So from that perspective, you know, I think you know, learning to program Android, you know, in the long run, you know, cannot be too bad of a decision. Um, I think you know, iOS is popular too, and there are definitely you know people who just want to use iOS devices and they are not going to switch to Android. Um, but at this point, you know, in <coughs> terms of market share, I can see Android, you know, on you know, it's still on the um, increasing side of uh, numbers. <coughs> iOS does pay out more to developers, though. Say again? Of uh, the market for iOS apps in general. It's more profitable in general. It's more profitable? For paid apps, not for ad revenue. Oh, OK. First Android, it's paying more ad revenue. Mm hmm And there was another hand I forgot. Go ahead. Yeah, so are there tools that allow you to target both uh, devices like uh, are, are there? That's a good question. and. Um, it's difficult to have one single solution for both devices because at the lowest level, um, Android devices are Java programmable. Okay, you program you know, Android <coughs> devices using Java, which is what we're gonna use in this class. iOS, on the other hand, uses Objective-C, which is not C++, okay? It's object-oriented programming language, but it's not C++. So when you have these two pretty much different programming languages as the um, programming language for the devices, it's pretty hard to um, quote unquote unify you know, the same type of code that will run on both types of devices. Um, the only way you can do the abstraction is to use a third language that is high level where you can have an engine to translate it on one side to Java to run on Android devices and on the other hand translate that into <laughs> Objective-C to run on iOS devices. Um, there might be products like, products like that already, but I'm, I'm not aware of it. Okay, so you know there are products yeah, like that. There's a program called PhoneGap that can do that for you. Say again? PhoneGap. PhoneGap, okay. So, so there are you know, um, things. Now, where does, does it start with Java or is Objective-C? JavaScript. JavaScript, <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so let me just kind of look it up and so put it up here. Phone. <coughs> uh, 
easily create apps using web technology you know and love, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. <coughs> they're not native apps, though, right? They're native. Oh, uh, they actually like, compile the apps. So it allows you to use JavaScript, HTML, and CSS to specify the app. But once you specify the app, it will quote unquote compile it into either Java or Objective C, and then from there you can you can also compile that to uh, bytecode and whatnot. My understanding yeah. is that it runs um, WebKit on your Android or iOS device. Okay. With some hooks to access the uh, phone's built-in features like the GPS. <laughs> okay. JavaScript and whatnot? So it is still native JavaScript, pretty much. I mean, it doesn't translate it into Java nor uh, Objective-C. Right, yeah. You, you don't have access to the actual code, but there's okay. Objective-C that you can get into modified. Okay, I understood. Okay, so it, it does have limitations then because it's not truly natively an app. <coughs> right, it's, it's more of a wrapper for uh, Okay. Kit. So probably people would not be using it for you know high-end games where you really want to squeeze out the last ounce of performance, but for simple things you know that only requires user interaction and you know upload something to the server, wait for the feedback, you know then it's suitable for that. Okay, that makes sense. Okay, thanks. Is Angry Birds available on iOS? I can only assume that it is. Yes. You know, on both platforms. Does anyone know you know how they you know? Create the two distributions, the one for Android and one for iOS. Do they use the same code base, kind of like this, or do they actually write? Did they actually write the program? There are two individual, you know, versions of the program: one in Java and one in Objective C. Does anyone know? What that would be kind of question. Your starting question. The question was, um, you know, with popular games that run on both types of devices, like Angry Birds. Um, do they write it in, you know, Java for <coughs> Android and then rewrite it in Objective C for iOS, or do, do they start with only one single language and they have a tool to target, you know, two different platforms? That would be kind of interesting to find out, right? Because you know, Angry Birds is a game. It's uh, it's somewhat, you know, demanding in terms of um, uh, processing resources. Um, so it, Temple Run is another one, you know, because that one is a 3D game and it is demanding in terms of graphics. So it'll be interesting to find out, you know, how they target multiple platforms, um, hopefully without having to rewrite everything, because otherwise it's a maintenance hardware. Whatever you do to one, you know, you have to do it to the other one. <coughs> All right. So this is a good resource. You know, thank you for uh, the mentioning of this. Uh, this is all getting recorded. Um, let me show you how to get to uh, the lecture recording for this class. Um, so basically all you have to do is to go to YouTube. So type youtube.com slash sumprofs, S-O-M-E-P-R-O-F-S as one word, okay? So that's that will get you directly to the <coughs> sumprofs channel in YouTube. So you will see something like this when you get to um, the, tar the, the channel. And from here, the easiest way is to click videos, you know, as a tab. And it will give you a list of um, lecture recordings using a reversed chronological order, which means the most recent recording will be listed first, okay? Um, and you can see that I have been uh, pushing uh, lectures from yesterday, okay, you know, 2014, uh, January 21st. Yep. Uh, row sheet. <laughs> thank you. So here's the row sheet. If you're trying to add to the class, I think the class is still open because I have, you know, there's plenty of uh, room in the class. So if you're, try if you're trying to add to the class, see if you can do it through e-surfaces. If not, you know, I can give you a permission number. Okay, we'll start here. Right. So, are there any questions at this point about this class? No questions. All right. So, we'll get to the first part here first. Getting started with Java is, you know, basically the first topic, and we'll start with that one. You just want us to initial on this? Yeah, just initial is fine. Thank you. All right. So, what we'll do, what I'll do is I will first talk about your know, tools 
And I don't think I can get to Java syntax today because you know there will be some discussion of you know how to get the development tools um, and you know, whether we you know, which way you want to do it you know is is the question. Okay. All right. Now before we talk about the development tools, it kind of helps to understand um, the the Android system as a whole first because you know that would give you an idea of. Why do we need so many different pieces? Um, and seemingly, they're coming from different people, too. Okay, so we'll just kind of focus on this part here. Um, what you need to develop apps for Android mobile devices, there are two main pieces. The first one is a Java compiler that is included in the JDK, <coughs> uh, the Java Development Kit. The second piece is the Android SDK, the Android Software Development Kit. So there are two distinct pieces that you need. And um, before we talk about, let's talk about why that is necessary. Refer to the Android architecture page for a more complete treatment. And I'll just right click and open up a new tab. You can do the same thing. I'm going to have to change the CSS you know, for Moodle because it doesn't show the links as links. All right, so here is a diagram of, a, of an Android system. Okay, the software system. As far as the software system is concerned, you know, it looks like this. Um, let's start with the top layer, okay, which is not the way I describe it in the notes. Okay. Starting with the top layer, we have applications. So applications will include you know, the typical ones like contacts, phone, browser, Angry Birds. Um, you know, any type of Android apps will be on the top layer. Those are applications. Those applications are written in mostly Java. And Java is a high level programming language. It is compiled to Java bytecode. Okay? So Java bytecode is kind of like object code or machine code, but it's not intended for a native processor to deal with. It is intended for a virtual machine. The second layer from the top is called the application framework. The application framework also has components mostly written in Java. And these are components that you cannot see usually. Okay? They're basically sitting in the background um, so that applications can utilize these particular components. Or sometimes these components can also get back to your application. In other words, if you require um, a timer, okay, you have something to keep track of time, then the framework has a timer implementation. But then when it's time to wake up your application, your application will get an event coming from the um, application framework. The top layer is not a part of the Android system. It is basically your apps. But starting with the second layer all the way down to the bottom layer, that's quote unquote the Android system. The third layer, the sec the third layer which composed of you know, this part here, the yellow part is called the Android runtime. And the most important part of the Android runtime is the um, Dalvik. How do you pronounce it? Is it Dalvik? Dal Dalvik Dalvik virtual machine. Um, it's basically a virtual machine. It's kind of like an emulator. It takes the Java bytecode, and it will quote unquote execute the Java bytecode by translating the Java bytecode into things to do with the native processor. Okay? So it's kind of like a JVM, you know, except it's called except it's not coming from Oracle. Um, this one um, was written from scratch by Android slash Google. And this is the main reason why uh, Oracle is suing Google. Does anyone know that uh, Oracle has been going after Google because of this? Okay. Um, initially, there was one judgment already. Uh, the judge basically said uh, Oracle had no ground, no reason to sue Google because you know, Google rewrote the entire Java virtual machine from scratch um, with only one little bit of code that is so common that you cannot say, oh, they copied it from me. Okay. Um, in fact, let me just kind of go there and you can decide for yourself. Oracle, Google, Java, suit. <clears throat> and Wikipedia has a pretty good documentation of this entire thing. 
Um, so right now, uh, Oracle is trying to resume the suit uh, in another court. I think they found a judge, you know, who is sympathetic to Oracle. So they're trying to, you know, redo the whole thing. They're trying to, you know, sue Google again. So it's not really settled yet at this point. Um, but at the heart of the lawsuit is not the programming language itself, but the implementation of the virtual machine. Okay. Any questions about this part? So you can look through this, you know, and you know, basically find out the history of all of this stuff here. Um, here. Oh, getting to back to the diagram first. There we go. So the Java virtual machine or the Android runtime is really the center of a lot of things because um, the code that you specify in Java translates to Java bytecode, and then the Java bytecode is interpreted by the Java uh, by the virtual machine, and then the virtual machine will execute the actual you know instruction that is native to the processor of your mobile device, okay? And that, in return, will basically use the Linux kernel for access to the actual hardware. In other words, anything, if you imagine there's an imaginary layer here, that's the hardware layer. In other words, everything that has to do with the hardware of your mobile device has to go through the Linux kernel. The Linux kernel is the bottom layer of the entire hierarchy of software. So that's why when people say Android is Linux, it's not entirely correct. Linux is a component of the Android system. It is not, you know, it's not saying that Android is Linux, but and Linux is a component of Android. All right, so looking at this picture, um, let me ask you a question. How many architectures can run Linux in, in terms of the type of processor and so on? Right, yeah, how many, uh, okay, Linux is available for how many architectures? <laughs> okay, okay, here, here is your you know, cho possible choices. Right. One, two, or many. <laughs> the answer is many, okay? So, which is really neat because your architecture sits below here and because Linux is available for many different architectures, it also means it is very easy to port Android to run on just about any hardware. Any architecture that can run Linux potentially can run Android because the other stuff that runs on top of Linux, um, the libraries probably are not written in Java. They're probably written in C or C++. But Anything that runs Linux already has GCC and G++ ported already. So things can be cross-compiled to different architectures. And then everything in the blue layer here, most of these are written in Java to begin with. So they are cross-platform compatible to begin with. The only thing that people have to do is to make sure that this portion, and also this portion, is retargeted to a new architecture. And most of the time, it is already cross-targeted. If you look at libc here, you know, it's the C library um, for, it's basically the runtime library of C programs. That's automatically, it's already ported because otherwise Linux itself is not going to run without libc ported. Okay? And this is going to be important later on when I talk about how to you know, debug your program because you can use virtual machines, very efficient virtual machines for um, Android. And I'm not sure that the same uh, applies to iOS. Uh, so, like drivers would be, oh, okay, I, I see it. It's part of the Linux kernel. Right, all the, the drivers, drivers are, are part of the Linux one. kernel. Yep. But, but they're unique to yeah. the hardware. They are unique to the hardware, that is correct. Um, but the emulation, at the emulation level, uh, they provide quote unquote standardized um, <laughs> hardware devices, they are emulated. So if your concern is to run an emulator efficiently, it's not going to be an issue. But every time you know, people come up with a new um, hardware device, like a new way to do touch screens, 
then you need a new driver at the Linux level. So you, you will need to update the red component of this picture. And, and the libraries, are, are they part of the uh, Java libraries? No, the Java part is the blue part. The green part typically would still be written in C and C++ and not in, uh, not in Java. Okay, yeah, OpenGL for sure is not you know, written in Java. So these are Linux kernel libraries? They are libraries that make use of the Linux kernel directly. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, are we going to be using any other type of emulator other than what is packaged with the uh, Android SDK? Um, <laughs> well, if you want to use well, your own. Well, just because it sounded like you were implying that there were better tools out there. Um, no, nope, no. Nope. The, uh, the the ones that are packaged with the Android SDK, you know, they are perfectly fine. You know, uh, there are tools to update it. I'll show you guys. You know, how have you already tried it? Uh, no? I've messed with the SDK previously. Oh, okay. Yep. Yeah. The um, Eclipse has come a long way. You know, the integration of Android tools into uh, uh, Eclipse has come a long way, and now it's really quite easy to use. Yep. So I will kind of demonstrate that part too, you know, as a part of today's lecture. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So this is the, the the layers. Now, why do we need JDK? JDK is needed in order to translate your application written in Java into Java bytecode that can be executed by the Android runtime component. That is why we need JDK. So if you want to get JDK, there are Depending on your host operating system or depending on your development platform, there are you know there may be choices, there may not be any choices. If you run Windows, you really don't have a choice. Okay, if you run Windows, what you need to do, you know, it's actually a part of my notes too. So I'm gonna go with my notes. And so we have just covered, you know, a portion, a good portion of these notes here. You know, I just did not read it directly from my notes. <coughs> Okay, so I'm here, you know, we are currently at this point. The JDK, um, <coughs> well, I'll go ahead and defer you know, the installation of this. Um, I'm not even sure whether you know, these Windows machines you know, have JDK already installed. I know yeah. they have JRE installed, but I'm not sure about JDK. Oh, you already checked? Thank you. So they already have JDK installed, so that's good. Okay, that's really helpful. Um, and there's a link to here. So there's a link here, you know, get the JDK from Oracle. You know, that's actually a hyperlink to the Oracle website so that if you do not have the JDK installed at home on the computers that you want to use for development, you can go to that link and download and install JDK yourselves. Uh, JDK is free, okay? You can still install it for free and, you know, it doesn't cost you anything. Yep. Uh, quick question going back to the JDL. Mm -hmm. Isn't there a uh, a version of JVM for each hardware platform anyway? If mm -hmm. so, why why is Oracle concerned? Does uh the sub uh, does Oracle provide JVM for any hardware platform? No, right. The the issue has to do with you know um, Oracle is claiming that Google copied uh, copyrighted code. From Oracle, that is basically the, the the heart of the lawsuit. Is that is that they copy the code? It's not like uh, Oracle has control over who implements JDM. They don't have control over who implements, you know, JDM or J, uh, the the virtual machine, nor the standard of the virtual machine. In other words, you know, the it's published. Okay, mm -hmm. this Java bytecode has to do these operations. This Java bytecode has to do, you know, needs to do these operations. So that part is published. And yeah, anyone can go in and implement an entirely different, you know, Java virtual machine that can do a, a, exactly the same thing. Okay? But Oracle is claiming that Google copied code directly from their implementation of the virtual machine. And so the source code of both virtual machines were actually presented, I think, in those cases. And people can only find one portion of the code to be quote unquote common, which is a very common code for bound checking for indexes. 
Okay, there are only so many ways you can do bound checking for indexes. So even the judge himself, I think the judge presiding presiding on this case um, was a developer or had been a developer, had been doing some software work. The judge said, you know, well, even I would come up with code like this if I were to ask to do bound checking code. So it's not, you know, enough ground to say that, you know, Google had copy code from, you know, Oracle. Um, but Oracle is starting the lawsuit again. You know, they found a judge, you know, who is sympathetic to their side of the story. So it's not done yet, unfortunately. Yep. Remember when they were trying to uh, claim they were copying API? They, 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 you know, it's, it kind of reminds me of many, many years ago, SCO, you know, sued a whole bunch of companies using Linux. You know, it's probably before the time of some of you, because it, it happened like at least eight, nine years ago. Um, and they claimed that, you know, SEO claimed that Linux copied code from the SEO uh, Unix implementation. And, you know, and it was, it turned out to be just, you know, uh, just allegations with no meat in it. Okay, and I think, you know, in this case, you know, we'll let the judges, you know, decide, you know, but I think it's not going to be a, it's not going to hold water. Now, on the other hand, if you use Linux, like I do, um, you can use OpenJDK, you can use you know, JCJ, GCJ, excuse me, GCJ, which is an open source GNU implementation of the Java compiler. So there are options, you know, if you're using Linux, but if you are using Windows, you pretty much have to use the Oracle version of the JDK. Of the JDK. Okay, so that's the first component. It's just really the compiler that you need from the JDK. But the JDK also includes JRE, the Java Runtime Environment, which is what you need to run Eclipse. So JDK is going to be you know, a useful component. The Android SDK is, you know, this is also a hyperlink. I really need to change the CSS, the cascading style sheets, so the hyperlinks actually show up as hyperlinks. Um, the Android SDK is um, at the Android website. So if I do a right click and open a new tab here, it is over here, getting the Android SDK, and it's pretty easy. I mean, you know, it is, uh, the web page itself is operating system sensitive, so if you go to this web page from Windows, it will give you the link to download the SDK for Windows, not for <coughs> Linux. But because I'm doing it from Linux, it knows and, you know, gives me the link to download the package for Linux. Um, this one does not require any administrative rights to download, and to install, so it's pretty handy because you can put it onto a USB device if you want to. Okay. There's only one restriction, okay? If you want to put this tool onto a USB device so it, it's portable, removable, um, the only restriction is it still needs to use JDK on whatever system you're trying to run it, okay? Because Eclipse itself requires JRE, and then when you are compiling your projects, you will need JDK. So whatever machine you plug it into to continue your project needs to have JDK installed. And that's the only limitation. But the Android SDK itself is, you know, does not require administrative rights. Okay. So if I plug my flash drive in, I have to have JDK on local machine. <coughs> hmm. Sorry. Yeah, you, there's an init file and no. you need to modify the init file to the yeah, path. Like, yep. I have my um, project on flash drive, plug mm -hmm. it into here, for it to work, I have to go the path to JDK. Correct. And there is a way to transplant JDK onto your flash device so it is quote unquote self sufficient. Uh, if you just look up, you know, using Google, you can look up um, Android SDK on USB device. Um, there are people who you know who will tell you exactly how to do it, so that you can have JDK the entire thing on your uh, USB thumb drive too. So some people have proven that that works. Uh, you wouldn't need to specify as long as the job on the system path. Sometimes it does it, sometimes it doesn't. <laughs> sometimes it doesn't. That's exactly right. <laughs> And partially it has to do with all the different versions of Windows because they, they are not exactly the same. The way they handle you know, paths and how to send them. Yeah, it's sometimes uh, I was working on a certain project that the tools required a Java home variable set. 
Mm -hmm. I completely uninstalled Java, reinstalled it, still not there, edit, uh, manually add it. In Windows, there is really no such thing as completely uninstalling something. <laughs> Most of the time, it leaves something behind in the registry or files and whatnot. Uh, it usually goes through manually and pull them out. Yep, okay. Yeah, or you can use some additional tools to clean it up, you know, after Not very you reliable. Install. Not reliable. <clears throat> okay, so this is also a component that you need, you need to install in order to, you know, get your um, tools to work. All right. The Android SDK has several components. The first component, well, the first one that I'm talking about here is Eclipse. Eclipse is interesting because it's a very modular and a very flexible IDE, integrated development environment. Think of it as kind of Visual Studio, you know, except it's, it's, it runs on, you know, Java itself, okay? So you need JRE, the Java Runtime Environment, to run Eclipse. Eclipse itself is not programming language specific. Um, without Eclipse software development, you know, it's still possible but then you will have to learn how to use a lot of the CLI or command line interface tools, which is not going to be easy. You'll be spending a lot of time, you know, just fiddling with all the command line tools. But with, with Eclipse, you know, everything is really easy. Uh, the second component to the Android SDK is the Android development tool plugin to Eclipse. In other words, Eclipse itself doesn't know how to deal with Android projects. Okay. It is the plugin that allows Eclipse to handle Android projects natively. In other words, you have a, I would say, somewhat WYSIWYG um, interface to, de to design screens, to put you know, user interface onto the screen. For those of you who have taken CISP 362, it feels kind of like um, App Inventor. You can just basically, basically quote unquote, drag and drop you know, user interface elements into your, onto your screen. So it's really handy that you can do that. Um, or if you have experiences with uh, Visual Studio, it's the same thing, okay? You can design forms, you know, like that, just by dragging and dropping components. It also has um, Android platform tools. Now, platform is a, it's a word that has multiple meanings depending on the context. In this particular case, a platform uh, refers to a version of Android. It can also refer to the system that you are using for development purposes. Okay. <clears throat> and also includes the latest Android platform. In this case, it's definitely a version of Android. Um, so depending on when you do the download, you might get the latest and greatest. I think the latest one is 4.4.2, um, but you might get the second latest if you did this last semester. Okay. But there's a quick and easy way to bring it up to date. I'll show you that too. So if yep. you're arguing Android and there's various <coughs> versions, so do you have to do a build for each version? Ah, that's a good question. Um, the Eclipse environment gives you a very, very easy way to specify um, how you want your app to work. Okay, it will give you a range. Okay, specify the earliest Android system that you want your app to work in, specify the latest one. So you can specify a range of um, versions of Android that your app is targeting, okay? Now once you do that, um, Eclipse is now aware of the SDK, uh, not the SDK, but the API, the application programming interface level that your application needs to target. So if you try to use anything that's only available to a later version of Android, later than the earliest version that you want to support, it will give you a warning and say, uh-uh, you know, this is not a good idea because this is only available to later versions of Android. So that is really, that's a good question, but the tool has a lot of help to make sure that your app will run in the version range that you specify. So it was just the one image Right, it's okay. one single APK. It will crank out only one single APK or Android package, um, but in the package, the, the meta file will specify that it will run in you know version blah to version blah. Yep. And the Google Play Store will allow you to upload multiple API, APKs depending on the device. Yep, that too. 
um, because each APK you know already has a specification of you know what version it's going to be able to run in. Yep. <clears throat> And the last component is the Android system image for the emulator. In other words, if you do not want to use an actual device for debugging and to test your application, you will probably be using an emulator. And um, as a package, as a, as a part of this package, it also includes the system image for the emulator for the latest version at the time when you download the SDK. But it can update itself as well later on. Well, let's do this part now. Okay, um, I'm going to demonstrate how I'm going to do it here, you know, in class using my um, live distribution of Linux. Now, when I talk about the live distribution of Linux, it runs on a uh, USB thumb drive uh, plus an external hard drive. So I and I can basically take my entire quote unquote operating system and all the user <coughs> files to any computer that can boot from a USB thumb drive. So to me, that's really handy because you know I have all the tools with me already. Yep. I have a question, unrelated topic though. If we're going to use our own laptops or whatever. That's perfectly OK. Are you going to use the router again, Mr. Mister? Because the Wi-Fi is pretty slow. Wi-Fi yeah. is terrible in here. <laughs> Uh, that's a good question. We still have that um, entry in the DHCP server, so it will still map that MAC address to um, a particular IP address. So we still have that capability. Um, but your Wi-Fi router, you know, was not reliable. So I think I'm gonna have to, you know, get another one, you know, for this purpose. So let me think about it, you know, because I have to. Uh, Somehow, you know, hide that fifty dollar, you know, cost from my wife, <laughs> and hopefully she's not watching my YouTube videos. <laughs> Tech, did you spend fifty dollars on something? What is that? <laughs> they won't give you a router. Hmm? They won't give you. A I can ask for one too from the from the from the from the lab. They probably have some just you know sitting around. The thing about Wi-Fi routers is, you know, the ones that are quote unquote free and floating around, they usually do not work very well. <laughs> All right. So let me go ahead and give you a demonstration of how the tools, you know, work and how the ins well, you know, the installation, the installation part is easy. You just you know, download the file, unzip it, and you're done. It's that easy. Okay. So once you unzip a file, okay. Okay, in this case is ADT bundle uh, Linux x86 2013-0917. So that's the exact date when I downloaded um, that particular package, the ADK, the uh, Android Development, um, what is the T? Toolkit. Toolkit. Tool. Tools. Okay. So once I unzip that file, you know, it gives me two subdirectories. One is called Eclipse, the other one is called SDK. So I will go to SDK first, okay? Under SDK, I have some additional folders. Um, almost every single one of these are folders except for, no, they're all folders. So with all, within all the folders here, um, I can go to tools. And inside tools, you know, there's a program, there's an executable called Android. Um, so if I run Android itself, this is what I'm gonna get. Um, so Android is basically a manager for the software development kit itself. In other words, it allows you to check for updates and it also let you, you know, do all the <coughs> updates to the software development kit without having to run anything on the command line interface. So it's pretty handy. So right now, I just did this yesterday, so I have everything up to date. In other words, I have the SDK tools, I have the platform tools all the way up to 19.0.1, which you know, we know as you know, uh, KitKat, the latest version of KitKat. Um, it has all the build tools. It has, um, this is, it's also internal, it's called API 19. Um, we have the documentation installed, SDK platform installed, sample code installed. Um, now this part is, is important. Uh, it has the Intel x86 add-on system image installed. In other words, this particular system image 
is designed to run on quote unquote Android devices using the x86 Atom processor. Now, if you go out there and try to buy a tablet or a cell phone that uses the Intel Atom processor, you won't be able to find any. Okay, people do not make hardware devices using the Atom processor. So, what is the whole point here? Well, here's the whole point. The whole point of having a system image that is targeting the x86 Atom processor is so that we can run um, Atom virtual devices much more efficiently this way. So once again, I have everything updated here. If I click on one of these things, okay, and go to edit, um, you can see you know, this is really just the name. You know, it's for you to identify which um, <coughs> Android virtual device we are talking about. Um, this is the device type. You know, I just choose this one to be a fairly small device, small screen. Um, the target is Android 4.4.2, and the processor is x86. Okay, because a lot of newer desktop and laptop computers have processors that have um, hardware virtualization acceleration, this image will run a lot faster than if I chose you know, the other processor. If I, do a, if I click here, you can see the other choice is an ARM processor. When you only have an x86 type processor as a hardware, and you're trying to run a virtual device using the ARM architecture, it's going to be very, very slow. Because you know, it has to take one instruction of the ARM processor, and then it will say, OK, now how do we do that using x86 instructions? So it's going to be very, very slow. The other one, on the other hand, is going to be fast because um, the x86 architecture, especially the ones with hardware acceleration, can do this a lot faster. And that's why we want to do it this way. So let me just kind of cancel. And I'll show you what happens when I start this virtual machine. So just go so ahead and launch it. So if it is sort of doing two translation, if you choose ARM, this is translate right. from the Java bytecode. To right. Arm In the yep, to yep. If you if you consider the entire path of execution, yeah. yes, it is going from Java bytecode to ARM native code, and then from there it goes through another emulation level to get down to x86 native code that the processor that i5 i7 can execute. Go ahead. What is worth? There are phones that run x86 processors. Sorry. There are phones that there run are? x86 processors. I did not know yeah. that. Yes. <laughs> I don't like them though. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yep, go ahead. Are there any known issues with Android and Windows 8? I cannot tell you because I do not <laughs> use Windows 8. <laughs> um, there are people here in this class who regularly use Windows 8, so I'll defer um, the discussion to those people. What was the question? Are there any known issues with Android and Windows 8? You mean the software or like ADP and stuff like that? Yeah, oh, okay. It actually runs a little bit better on Windows 8. Well, this one is actually running pretty slow right now um, well, because in the other classroom, it's on right away. The reason um, why is because Windows 8 supports virtualization natively. So when you run a virtual machine, which is what basically is going on right now, it's faster. Because well, it, well it has to do it the way that Hyper-V manages host and guest operating system. It's just quicker. Well, right now it's not using a KVM for sure. Okay, let me let me see if it's using KVM. Oh, well, KVM is installed, so it should be being used. And it, this is awfully slow, you know, having a KVM installed. Let me see what type of processor I have. This particular <coughs> The i5 processor should be a lot faster than this because the i5 processor has um, virtualization acceleration, you know, because of this uh, VMX extension. So it should be running a lot faster than this. I have no idea why it's running so slow. That is really slow. Is uh, well, I'll just kind of let it run here, and um, so this is how you can start a virtual machine. Yep, go ahead. You have one question. 
what on my computer, mm -hmm. the Intel x86 system image through the SVJ mm -hmm. doesn't show up. Is it grayed out or not showing up at all? It doesn't show up at all. Remember I had that, that issue before from the other class? Mm -hmm. So how did we resolve it? I, don't I didn't. It, it just didn't show up, then all of a sudden it did. Okay. Um, Chris, do you want to uh, just click the update link here and see if you can uh, bring the um, available packages up to date? Yeah, well, I'm waiting on it right now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, this is what I meant, you know, when I said, you know, you can basically manage the entire SDK tool chain <coughs> itself, you know, and keep it up to date using just this tool. Okay, it's really handy. Um, but since it's waiting, I'm going to start something else. So I'm going to start, um, go to Eclipse. Okay, from the root of the installation folder, I can now go to Eclipse. And if you look at Eclipse, and I, if I show the color, it shows better. There are only two quote unquote executables. The other one is a library. And this one is the only executable, which is Eclipse. So let me just go ahead and run Eclipse here, and then we'll see what it looks like. And this Eclipse implementation has the Android tools already, the, all the plugs in, the plugins are already integrated. So it's really, really cool. Um, it will ask you for the workspace. So in this case, this is not the right workspace, you know, because you know it only works when I have my other computer. So I'm going to you know change the work workspace to wherever you can find um, the files. So we'll go to the user folder here and work. <coughs> And if the folder does not exist, it will create it. All right, so this is the first page that you see. You know, you can actually go through the tutorial, assuming the tutorials are actually installed. If they're not installed, then you have to install them first. So instead of doing this, I'm going to start a new Android application. And here is the, these are the questions you have to answer when you uh, start a new Android application. Um, if you just hover over a particular box or something that you can interact with, it will pop up its own you know, help. So this one is just the application name. You, know, you only have to make sure this name is unique to you. Okay? It doesn't have to be unique to other people. So let's say we call this one, you know, we'll just call it test. Okay? It automatically populates the other two fields. Now if you click on the exclamation point, you know, the warning sign, it says you know, this application name is shown in the Play Store as well as in the Manage Application List in Settings. Okay, so you might want to choose a different name. Okay, CISP 363 Test. Okay. And here's a warning too. Nope. Okay. It's still known in the Play Store? I don't think so. Okay, now this one is different because when you look at a package name, this is generic. So for as far as you are concerned, you can still use example.com you know, as your uh, package name, but if you're really publishing your software, you probably have a website associated with you as an organization. So you should spell your organization backwards in order to determine the package name. So in, in other words, if drtech.org is the organization name of my quote unquote company, then I should use you know, org.drtak you know, as, um, um, as the package name. The package name has to be unique after the application is installed on an Android device. So that really is the bottom line because you don't want your package name to coincide with the package name of another application. So that's why you gotta make sure that your package name is correct. It correctly reflects your organization. <clears throat> we still have an exclamation point with application name because it wants a 
by convention, the first letter should be uppercase, and that's why it's complaint. Now here is the part that answered a question earlier, is you know, how do you specify, or can you specify, um, what version of um, Android this particular application can run in? So here you have you know, a drop-down box here, basically, and you can choose and say, well, I want this particular application to run on devices that are running at least Android 3.0 Honeycomb. So you can specify an earlier or later version of Android. Now depending on what you choose, it will also determine what features you can use. Because some features are only available to later versions of Android. So you have to choose kind of carefully because if you select an er a version that is too early, then your app will look really archaic because it cannot have the feel and look of an app that is designed for the later version of Android. Now, if you choose you know, the minimum version to be too late, then it won't run on some of the older devices, right? So that's a limitation. Um, as you said a little bit earlier, you can also you know, have another one to target a different range of platforms. So that's one way you can do it is to have multiple APK files you know, one APK file that is quote unquote universal and one APK file that will only target the later versions of Android. Um, but then the code would still be slightly different because, you know, later versions of Android support certain things that earlier ones do not support. Um, does, uh, does Java support something like uh, conditional compile or uh, the pre pre I don't think so, you know, be, but it does have, it has runtime binding, you know, which somewhat eliminates the necessity to do conditional compilation. And then the target SDK, you know, according to this documentation, yeah, is the highest AP, API level that the application is known to work with. Um, so in this case, you can choose the latest one if you want to. Compile with, now this part depends on what is installed. Okay. Um, in my case, if you go back to the other screen, you know, I have basically you know, just the latest one installed and that's why I only have this one available. The theme also depends on you know, what is installed here. I only have three choices here or choose none. All right. So once you know, all, everything is specified here, I click next. Um, create custom launcher icon. The launcher icon is what you see after you install the app. You know, that's the little icon. Uh, create activity. <coughs> the word activity is specific to Android systems. Um, and activity is quote unquote a screen. Okay, so this will create a default screen um, for this particular application. Okay. Uh, we'll go over these terms later on, you know, to be much more specific. But an activity, as far as we are concerned at this point, is kind of like a screen, you know, to you know, other types of uh, uh, contexts. Uh, create project in workspace. It's just confirming, you know, where we are creating this project, and we can click next. Um, these are the uh, uh, icons, you know, for the launcher trim around blank space so you can you know increase the trim it basically you know says you know do you want to have empty space around the little icon here um, background color you can change it to something else so if everything is okay here we can go forward if you already have image files created you can also go to browse and go to your own image file and choose to use those as your icon but since I don't have anything prepared at this point, I'm just going to use the default one here. Um, and here, when we're creating the activity, which is quote unquote the, the screen for your particular application, you can have three choices here. Now, this part depends on you know, what you have chosen earlier, because some of these is not supported by earlier versions of Android. Um, so if I were to go back, and change this to let's say you know 2.1, and the selection will be slightly different. 
yeah, it still gives me the same selection, but later on, you know, when I design elements, um, if some of these will not be available. So we'll go for a blank activity with nothing in it. Um, it asks you about the activity name, um, the layout name, and these are mostly just for identification purposes. Now, right here, you can see that um, if I choose something, it tells me that it requires a minimum SDK version of at least 11, and I only specify 7. So this is why it is important to choose the right minimum uh, version level, because if you want to utilize some of the features of the later versions, um, it just you know, says, okay, you cannot do it because you know, this application is supposed to work with Android 2.1, and Android 2.1 does not support this particular layout. Yep? Uh, is there a documentation uh, saying that what, what version support what? Yeah, there is a built-in, um, if you go back to the <coughs> screen that lets you select um, the earliest version, so it says right here, if you select API 8 or later, um, you reach approximately 95% of the market. Um, but it also depends on you know, how you want your app to feel and look like, because if you want it to be kind of more modern looking, utilizing the, the latest you know, features of Android, then you kind of have to give up some of the market share and just say, well, you know, the, these earlier versions of Android is not going to be supported by this app. Okay, so you kind of have to make a decision, you know, which one is more important. Do you want your app to run on any platform, or do you want it to look better, but limit it to only the newer versions of Android? Yep. When you put an app box that's not supported, does it just say it's not supported, or what does it do? Um, that's one of the, okay, let, let me switch back to that screen here. I mean, if so like if I select something, yeah. sorry, go ahead. Like if you put one on your phone, would it not install it, or? It won't install because the APK file contains the manifest file. It's an XML file, and in it, it specifies that this particular app can only be installed when you have Android blah to version blah. And that's why it won't install it. Even if you turn on um, the option to install APK from the file and not check it, it will still not install it because of the version conflict. Um, that's the other thing that's nice about Android as opposed to iOS is on most Android devices, at least all that I know of, um, you can turn on that option and say, I want to be able to install an APK file from a file and not from the Play, uh, Play Store. Um, as far as I know, you know, um, by default, iOS devices does not have that option. You cannot just say, oh, here's an APK file or whatever file. Install the app from the file. It doesn't let you do it. But with Android devices, you can. In, in other words, in theory, you don't even need to put your app on the market in order for other people to install it. If, some, if it's just a few friends that you want to send an app to, you know, as long as they turn on that option to install APK from a file, you know, they can install your app you know, without having to go to the market. Yep. Due to uh, licensing in Google Play, there are some uh, off-brand devices that just don't uh, include any Google stuff? Correct. Um, Google, um, they need to get the authorization from Google to have um, certain Google apps installed. And as a result, you know, the Play app itself sometimes is not included in some of those, on some of those devices. Um, there are people who hack it, you know, and basically make it possible to install Play Store on those devices. Um, but those usually are very inexpensive, you know, devices. Um, I know the Kindle uh, tablet does not include Play Store natively. That's for a different reason. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Amazon. As far as Amazon and Kindles are concerned, you know, they have their very own reasons not to have the Android Play Store. Does that even have the Android Play Store by default? I don't think it does. You mean the Kindles? Um, the Kindle Fire and uh, the actual like Nook. The Nook? Yeah. Uh, Nook natively does not, but there are people who hack Nukes. Um, you can install, you know, a regular Android on it, and right. then you right. can also um, flash it. Yeah, you can reflash it with all the uh, Google tools on it too. Yep. 
All right, so getting back to that screen, you know, the, uh, the question was, This template depends on the Android support library, which is ne either not installed or the template depends on a more recent version. So it wants re version 8, and I don't have any installed. Do you currently have it set to version 7? Oh, okay, I see. And you can just click, you know, upgrade or install, and that takes care of this particular issue. Just you know, accept the license, install it. So that's why you know it's a really kind of nifty tool for software development because it's kind of self-contained. Um, and when you click finish, this is really the cool part. I mean, it's it's so busy week. Um, so here we have a package explorer, and um, it's just being slow. So if I click, you know, activity full screen, this is the portion that designs um, the screen or the quote unquote the activity for this particular application. Um, on one side, you know, here you have the canvas. So this, well, not in the same sense as a uh, app inventor, but you have the um, um, a preview, a preview of the screen, and on the other side you have, you know, all the things that you can put onto the screen. Um, you can have text fields of different kinds, um, different types of layout. You know, a layout is basically a container. So if you put a layout onto a screen, then you can drag and drop additional components into the layout so you can basically enforce a particular type of layout you know, within your application. Um, you can have images and media, time and date, and so on and so forth. So this part is, you know, WYSIWYG. It's what you see is what you get. Kind of like, you know, App Inventor. Um, for those of you who told CISP 362. Um, so are there any questions about this? Questions? So you can see it's really just that. You know, drag and drop. You know, you can have components put into the <coughs> application. Um, are there any questions? Let's take a look at the source code first, okay? You know, and that will be the last thing that we do today. Um, this is the source code. It's basically a template. Um, it's defining a class called full screen activity right now. In Java, one big difference between Java and C++ is in C++, you still start execution from the main function, okay? There's still a a function that is outside of any type of classes, outside of any objects called main, and execution starts with main. In Java, it is completely object-oriented in the sense that there, there are no functions floating outside of you know, a class. Okay, a function has to be within a class. So in this case, you know, your full screen activity, you know, that particular screen, has all of these you know, templates. Yep. No main function. So it's sort of like a, uh, doesn't have main, it's like a, uh, a web app, call that a uh, servlet? Um, execution, when you, when you start an application, a particular object is going, a method <coughs> of a particular object will be, okay, I take it back. An object is going to be created by, you know, from a particular class and then a method out of that particular object is going to be called, and that's the starting point of your application. Now, when, you, when we deal with applications like this, it's user interactive, so for the most part, it's event-driven. In other words, your application is not actively doing something, it's waiting for an event to happen, like a touch of a button or something like that. When that happens, um, because the application has already registered certain methods with the Android system and basically say, when this button is clicked, call this particular method of this particular object. And that's how you know, your code gets triggered when something happens on the screen or when a timer expires and, some, and stuff like that. 
It's mostly event-driven programming. It's kind of like, uh, so this part is the same as CISP 362. If you remember, you know, there's a, there are blocks that says, you know, when button blah, blah, blah clicked, right? It's the same thing here. It's just that, you know, we're using Java instead of uh, drag and drop blocks. Okay. All right, so I think we're gonna stop here, you know, because we are kind of well past the, uh, the lecture time today. Um, so for those of you who want to kind of experiment with the tool, you can go ahead and install it here. If you have a thumb drive with you, you can install it on your thumb drive as well. Um, and just kind of, quote unquote, you know, play with the tool a little bit. Um, we'll actually start to talk about the Java syntax and how, do you, how you attach code to the template that is already created here by the tool on next Monday. Any questions? Okay. Um, how many people are kind of considering using my live distribution? You don't have to, I mean, you know, it's just you know, one way to do it. Maybe. <laughs> so can you uh, explain the live distribution on the cloud? Uh, it's a Lin okay. Linux OS on a USB thumb drive? Yeah, it's uh it's on a thumb drive. Let me stop the recording first, you know, because I, I need to read